This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 507, recorded on August 17th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. How's the weather? And you know what? It looks a little muggy out. I mean, it looks it's, muggy. It, since when is mugginess? Well, it's you because see. New Jersey looks as though it has been muted in colors. Uh, it's not quite as clear as it is, as usual. And the cloud cover looks a bit scattered and high with – I don't see any cumulus clouds anywhere. I, 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 31 in the Celsius. Corner. Maybe one in the corner I do, but – Chance of rain, 30%. Yeah. Also, and it's hot. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello. So, uh, so what's the weather like here? You know, this morning I tried to find the weather – on six different apps, and it just wouldn't load. Finally, I had to go upstairs and listen to my NOAA weather radio. Or just look out the window. Uh, <laughs> no, well, I wanted to know whether it was supposed to rain and uh, that sort of thing. So uh, it's taking a while again here to load. Gee. But it's uh, mostly cloudy, and it is supposed to uh, potentially rain. And now I'm scrolling back to this hour, and it says that right now it's uh, – that's not right. It says it's raining, <laughs> <laughs> mm. and it's not. Somewhere it's uh, raining. I think it's 81. Here, I can just look here, too. It's uh, 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius. It's not Celsius. bad. 78 no, is it's nice. Pretty nice, yes. How's your humidity? I'm sorry. Uh, 66%. That's still pretty high. Yeah. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is 87 Fahrenheit, 31C overcast. Um, and we have uh, on the radar, I can see a line of storms that are just about to hit uh, moving across <laughs> Connecticut and Massachusetts. From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? We have uh, 96 degrees. <laughs> exactly. So it's oh. cool down. That's uh, 35C. Uh, sort Oof. of partly cloudy skies. Uh, just really, we're into the intense heat of summer. Um, I could use some of Alan's rain, big right. time. This is the hottest month, August. Uh, I don't really know. July, August are uh, yes, hot. Yeah. We the can certainly spare the, the rain. Next, We've been getting drenched. Yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could really use some drenching. Forecast for the next several days is uh, on the order of a hundred. Well, that's the prediction of weather of climate change, right? It's the oh, yeah. same amount of rain so I don't, in different you know, places. I, yeah, I think the biggest effect of climate change here is probably rain. Yeah, that's uh, right. I think I think that the uh, um, temperature is this is about normal. Yeah. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hello. Um, <laughs> it's basically the same here, I think, than it that it is in the city. Um, it's about 88 and uh, Fahrenheit or 31C, and we've got the clouds. Yeah. Um, we've got the humidity. And Rich, I think we're going to have rain all weekend, so you can have mine. Uh, <laughs> boy, I would love it. Rich, what fraction of the time do you spend indoors there? Uh, actually, I spend quite a bit of time outdoors because if I don't, I go crazy. <laughs> Um, uh, is so, and the, the trick is to go out in the morning, I get up and I go rowing or I go to the gym or mm -hmm. something like, well, the gym is not really, uh, out of doors, but, uh, uh, rowing is good and being out and about is good. Rowing so, is in an actual boat? Uh, like a shell. A like, shell. Yeah. Uh, okay. Nice. You know, the, yeah. A skull, like a racing skull? Yeah. Right. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Mm hmm I just started that in like February or something like that. There's a rowing club up on uh, uh, Lake Austin, and it was a good way for me to. I like to be on the water. Uh, I'm looking for low impact, full body sort of uh, exercise. I hear all that, and uh, want to get outside, and so it does all of those. Hmm. Cool. All right. I would like to again ask everyone to see if you can help the viruses and cells. Gordon Research Conference. They need some help raising money for their meeting next year. 
which is being run by Julie Pfeiffer and Britt Glounsinger. They need $70,000 to support registration and travel costs for 32 speakers, 18 discussion leaders, and selected students and postdocs. You can go to the secure donation site. Just go to microbe.tv slash TWIV. Any recent episode of TWIV, you'll find the link, and you can give a little bit of money, and you'll be acknowledged as a friend of TWIV. Or you could give a lot of money. Well, if you want to give a lot of money, give it to us. Right. <laughs> we'll be glad to transfer some of that over to the virus. And if you want to give small amounts, you could, well, we would, usually that's what you give us also. But yeah. you know, the, the Gordon Conference is a one-shot thing. Uh, our, our shows go on as long as you'll listen. <laughs> as long as there's someone out there listening, we'll keep doing it. And the day that zero people listen, then we'll close shop, I guess. Uh, Outbreak. The American Society for Microbiology is proud to support outbreaks, epidemics in a connected world. This is an exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. It's going through May 2021. Uh, Here at TWIV, we're excited to see the topic of zoonotic viral diseases getting such a public platform. Not the actual diseases, but... You know, discussion of them. As a tie-in, we'll be discussion discussing the latest information on one of the viruses featured in the exhibit in a special segment each month. The last one we did was on Nipah virus, and today I figured we'd talk about Ebola viruses since we've been talking about them recently. And don't forget, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, check it out. It's free. And don't miss TWIV 501, which was our show right in the exhibit itself. So this month's virus, as I said, is Ebola virus. And these viruses are all spillover zoonotic type viruses that they cover in the uh, Smithsonian exhibit. It was first recognized in 1976, Ebola. So there are multiple kinds of Ebola viruses, which we'll get to in 76 in Zaire and Sudan. And there were, in, in Zaire, 318 cases, infection spread by close contact with patients using contaminated needle, needles. Sudan outbreak, 284 ca- cases started in workers in a cotton factory and amplified by transmission in a hospital. Now, this wasn't the first of this kind of virus, meaning a filovirus. Earlier, Marburg virus had been described in 1967. Uh, during outbreaks in Marburg and Frankfurt in Germany and in Belgrade. And uh, in in Germany, it was because of uh, infected monkeys. Grievet monkeys in a primate facility had been imported from Africa, and they were infected, and the infection uh, spread to some of the workers. Uh, And that was the first identification of Marburg virus, named after the city, and they didn't object to having a virus, a particularly lethal virus, named after them. <laughs> so it's uh, how about the uh, uh, outbreak in Belgrade? Do they know where that came from? Same, I think it's the same idea. Oh, so the German workers here. I'm not sure where the Belgrade outbreak, but I would suspect it's a similar situation. But one one could look it up. <laughs> I will. <laughs> All of a sudden, robots appear on my screen. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> they're not robots. They're not They're robots. Shells. Ah, it's a robot. Yeah. You row it. <laughs> <laughs> bow in and bow out. That's what you row, uh, Condit? That thing? Bow, bow in and bow out. Uh, I got to uh, gotta see. Oh, yeah. That's it. Oh, uh, that's Kathy's picture from uh, the shell house at the rowing club. Oh, she's got a bunch of pictures of the rowing club. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was about to put in one of where you row, too. I but, guess people yeah. don't really, not interested in Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now I was trying to count all the Ebola virus outbreaks, and it's not easy because it depends what you consider an outbreak, right? Is right. one person an outbreak? <laughs> In the U.S., no, but two plague cases are. Yeah. One really? is not, two is. There's a standard for that. Yep. Okay. Is that right? Huh. Yeah, one's a spurious case, two, that's trouble. Right. So there have been a number of single case uh, epidemics or inc- incidents, like in Italy, there was a single Inc- case. That's right. So I, I just counted more than one, and I found twenty six, but it could be wrong. But you get the picture; it's less than, let's say, it's less than thirty. 
<laughs> right. There is a good page at the CDC that summarizes the chronology of the outbreaks. There's also one at WHO. We'll put these links in the show notes. Mm-hmm. The latest one we've talked about uh, just, I think, last time. There have been two recent outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in two different places. And as we have said, they're being responded to by, by uh, vaccination. Oh, yes. Yeah, so here is an, as well, another. Well, and also, also other containment efforts. It's not just a vaccination campaign, but that is one of the tools in the box now. Right. Well, I, I don't think I said it was just vaccination. Right. They are, be, they are being, be, right. That's one of the things that's being done. Someone stuck in a list of Ebola outbreaks according to major or minor, right? They call them major or massive cases, <laughs> which is hmm. great. And all the way down, minor or single cases. Hmm. Yes. So if you count all these, there's obviously more than 26. So you can uh, judge. I counted mostly the major ones. Um, and they still don't know where it comes from. Well, there's some thoughts. Usually, at first, that's a good question, and it reminds me to tell you, every one of these, uh, except for most of these major ones, are brand new spillovers from a forest source. And often they can identify bushmeat as the source, so people uh, hunting uh, animals in the forest or, or finding dead ones and eating them, and, and that's the source of infection. It begins a chain of infection. But sometimes they don't know what the origin is, but it's assumed to be something like that. The actual reservoir in the forest, you know, it's been suggested to be certain bats, but no one has isolated infectious virus from Sorry. bats. They have Sorry. got antibodies that cross-react. I think there's some PCR positivity. For Marburg, they have identified infectious virus from cave-dwelling bats, but not for Ebola virus. So mm. that's the idea. Now, I say the major outbreaks are all separate spillovers because obviously if it goes from West Africa to Italy or to the U.S., that's the same virus. It's so, the same. so the one that occurred at Marburg, um, yeah. those were monkeys. How did the monkey come across that from bats if they're <laughs> herbivores? <laughs> well, not all monkeys are only strict herbivores, right? I, I appreciate that, actually. <laughs> Thank no, you very much. Very much so, in <laughs> fact. Remember, Jane Goodall didn't find out that chimpanzees ate meat until they discovered that they were uh, fighting with each other. And when they did, they conquered their victims and ate them. Yeah. And that, yeah. that was not a behavior that was easily discernible. It took 30 years for that data to come out. So I think the monkey that they imported is a herbivore. Mm-hmm. Most most are. I mean, 99% of them. I don't know any that but we specialize don't, in eating meat. Do right, you? but we don't Except know. Us. Do Do we know? Well, we don't specialize in eating meat either. We're omnivores. Um, well, Alan. The, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, if you so, go to you Mongolia, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, okay, but if you go to India, you might. That's true, uh, but you know, it's <laughs> no, 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 no. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, anyway, we we don't really know. At least I don't think we really know how it gets from whatever the reservoir host is into primates at all, right? Yeah, yeah. but you just said something about bush meat, and that triggered well, right. the so, thought, right? So bush meat, bush meat. The idea is that That's somebody easy. kills a monkey or an ape. Um, and in the process of butchering that or or whatever, um, manages to get exposure to the virus that is presumably in that primate's bloodstream. Um, but how that ape or, or monkey got exposed to it in the first place is still a mystery because we think probably bats, but we don't know if it's coming through bat guano or if it's that mm. the, you know, the bats are getting eaten by the, by the chimpanzees or that seems like a bit of a stretch. Um, so I, I, that that part of the process is still kind of fuzzy. So, so for Marburg, the virus has been isolated from Egyptian fruit bats. So Dixon, can you imagine a way that it would get from a fruit bat to a, a grivet monkey? Yeah, I can actually. How? And, well, and that's also easy because they both Wikipedia, eat the same fruit. Wikipedia also says that uh, they sometimes eat small rodents. Who? The grivet monkeys. Yeah, so, I oh. saw that as well. The so they're omnivorous. The they're omnivorous. Exactly. Also, I think I think in general, if you look closely enough, just about every no, I, species that eats plants will eat uh, will, will eat some animal protein if the opportunity presents itself. I totally agree with that. It's a hard question. You, it's going to be hard to see in action, right? 
Yeah, but yeah. another question to raise then is that these vir- these um, monkeys that they imported for a presumably scientific research appeared to be healthy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are they not susceptible to the effects of Ebola virus? No, those monkeys started to get sick as well. So the Marburg monkeys got sick eventually, and um, as we'll see, the, there are other monkeys uh, infected right. with Reston Ebola virus, right. and they got okay. sick okay. as well. But we in know. the case of the rest, and the humans did not get sick. Yeah, exactly. Humans did not get sick, right? They sero- some seroconverted, and they did not get sick. Yeah. So they thought of it as a good, maybe, candidate for a live vaccine. Well, you know what? There have been, like, less than 10 human infections. So I would hold yeah. judgment on whether it's attenuated or not, wow. right? Do we, do we know how the spillover happened in the case with the cotton factory? <laughs> that one yeah. seems less clear to me. Well, ma- yeah, many of them are, are not clear. Let's see. The cotton factory. We could gin, gin up some kind of explanation. Bats in their, bat, <laughs> bats in their belfry. Yeah, the index cases. Yeah, I, I don't know that we actually know. That was uh, Sudan, right? Yeah. Mm, it was. Let's see if we can look at the WHO study. Uh, Did they canvas the victims? Oof. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I can weave these all day. I'm going to just say something about weevil weevil viruses, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they they know what I the. I, there was I remember reading somewhere that there was some uh, some meat involved, but I don't remember, and it's not coming to me right now. So we'll leave that unless someone wants to go look at it. Hmm. In the meanwhile, I don't know. And that brings up the nomenclature as Jens next week. Is it Jens or Jens? Does anyone know? I think it's Jens. Jens Kuhn. It's Jens? With a Y. Jens. Jens. Uh, he will join us next Friday to talk about bioweapons. And uh, exactly. he he's on the International <laughs> Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses, and he's a proponent of proper naming of viruses. Yes. I'd like to suggest something to the group. <laughs> yes. Um, and since we enjoyed being together uh, down in Texas so much, um, would it be possible, since this exhibit at the Smithsonian is going to last through 2021, could we possibly schedule a live broadcast from the exhibit? Well, we already did one. They already did. From? Yes. We did? Well, you weren't there, but could yeah. We, could we do two? Could could we no, do two? and it was so hard to schedule that one. No, I, I was not aware of it. First of all, it, sorry, I guess I've, yeah, I, I wasn't there, I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Uh, it was in June. And <laughs> all right. No, I AS, know where I was. I it was, was arranged. By, it was arranged by ASM. I see. Okay, fine. And it was extremely difficult because it's a government institution, as you know. That's true. And as the guy told me when I went, he said, things happen very slowly. <laughs> government. Right. It's too bad you didn't. <laughs> Ask me, though, because I have a good friend, and you know him, too, Robert Guads. Yeah, I know. He's a docent Gee, there. You know, Dixon, I don't know why I didn't you ask Probably, because I, I was in Mongolia. <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of red tape, and we had to get there at 6 a.m. to, to film before oh, I see. I see. Uh, the museum opened. Oh, gee. And so, right. we've done and it. Dixon, it's a really good episode. You should listen to it. I'm going to listen do it. To it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, we had then, uh, good people on. And then okay. you should see the exhibit, because it's a great exhibit, too. Absolutely. That's the reason why I suggested it. But yeah, he this. wanted us to pay for his trip. That's why. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. No, ba- he didn't. <laughs> back to the nomenclature. So Jens. I still have a question about when it should be Ebola virus one word or Ebola virus two words. <laughs> and are we really clear on that or are we going to have to wait for Jens? So if you want to just talk about Ebola viruses, they've the ICTV said you could say Ebola space virus, right? Okay. And then it's capitalized? Yes. Okay. But then when you're referring to specific ones, you have to call it Ebola virus, one word, with the species name. So there are one, two, three, four, five species, including Zaire Ebola virus, which was the 1976 most common you see in, in most of the outbreaks. So it's Zaire space Ebola virus, one word. Then we have Bundibugyo Ebola virus, identified in 2007 in Uganda. The Reston Ebola virus, found in Reston, Virginia in 1989. And that was in a set of van- monkeys that had been imported, I think, from the Philippines. They arrived, started getting sick, and then um, did necropsies and the People working on them, seroconverted, but didn't get sick. Six seroconversions. And and then subsequently, there are some outbreaks in uh, Philippine 
uh, monkey colonies as well. Sudan Ebola virus, 1977, and Thai forest Ebola virus, 1995, one human case. It was a pathologist who was doing a necropsy on a animal who had died and ended up getting infected with this. So, you how, st- how different are these viruses? <sighs> Genome wise, they're different. So I'm different <laughs> enough to call them species. Th- so uh, it, my it, right. uh, my understanding is, if if Thai forest. You can call it Typhorus. It's about 10% identity. If there's less than 10% difference in the genome sequence, once you get over 10%, then it would be one of the others. Okay. I'm not sure if that's correct, but <laughs> y- Jens might tell us. We could ask Jens. Ask Jens next week. Just interested. Uh, by the way, I found uh, a sort of an answer, mm-hmm. at least some comment on the cotton factory. Wow. First reported cases of Sudan Ebola virus were in three workers at a cotton factory in Zara. N Z A R A in close proximity to three game reserves. Wow. The method of acquisition was unknown. Right. Okay. <laughs> As <laughs> usual. The method, <laughs> method. Method of acquisition. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we say we're going to have a protocol today. <laughs> That's nice. I thought we'd just talk a bit about the molecular biology because we really don't ever do that. Um, mostly we talk about uh, transmission and prevention, et cetera, disease. So these, of course, are when they were discovered, they were kind of unique animal viruses. They were filamentous. Mm-hmm. And the very first electron micrographs are iconic now by showing these filamentous viruses. And that's where filovirus came from. You're pointing to the picture on my wall. I am. Who but a virologist would have a Looks like a piece of, of modern art, actually. Anyway, um, there's, their genome is single-stranded RNA negative polarity. So it's encapsidated in a nucleocapsid in the virus particle. It's 19,000 bases in length, and it's coated with a nucleocapsid or nucleoprotein. And the genome encodes seven genes in the order NP for the nucleoprotein. Then there's VP35, VP40, the glycoprotein, VP30, VP24, and the L is the polymerase, the RNA polymerase. And each of these proteins is made from a subgenomic messenger RNA produced from the negative strand RNA. If you're interested in what these proteins are, these cryptic names, except for a couple, NP nucleoprotein, of course, is the one of the proteins that coats the RNA, and VP30 is also a minor nucleoprotein. And the L and so the v- for virus protein. <laughs> yeah, virus protein, exactly. Yep. In the old days, when you identified viral proteins, you didn't know what they did. You called them. VPs, <laughs> right, and often you'd you'd run them out on a gel and then call them VP and their molecular weight, right? Yeah. Sometimes for picorners, they say, "Oh, look, there are four of them. Let's call them four v- them, VP right. one, two, three, and four. You know, which of course turned out not to be in that order in the genome. Yeah. Oh well. So the polymerase is made up of L and VP thirty five. This copies the RNA, makes messenger RNAs. G is the glycoprotein, trimeric spikes in the envelope, and spikes will be a topic of today's paper later on. Mm-hmm. VP40 is the matrix protein, which is just beneath the membrane. And then we have multifunctional proteins, VP2434 and VP40, have various immune antagonist functions, which people are very excited to work on. These have been structurally worked on um, uh, by Erica Sapphire Ullman, and she's talked about that on Twitter before and others and um, maybe in part what makes the infections so um, pathogenic. So these these viruses attach to cell surfaces. No one has identified a specific receptor. They seem to bind to multiple attachment factors, and they get taken up by a process called micropinocytosis, not endocytosis, small vesicles coming in from the surface, a virus then goes into the endocytic pathway. In the endosome, the glycoprotein is cleaved by cysteine proteases called cathepsins, which exposes a binding site on the glycoprotein for a endosomal luminous lumen receptor, Neiman Pick type C integral membrane protein, MPC1, which... Cathepsins are proteases. Cathepsins are proteases. MPC1 is a cholesterol transporter, which turns out to be 
the receptor for Ebola virus. And in in fact, one of the nice experiments, Kartik Chandran has been on TWIF to talk about this. If you get fibroblasts from people with Neiman Pick disease who do not produce functional NPC1 transporter, they're resistant to Ebola infection. But you do not want Neiman Pick disease as a solution for Ebola. You do not because no. you typically die mm-hmm. in your in your ten or eleventh or twelfth year. So, of age. so NPC NPC one is a receptor, but it's not the initial attachment receptor. Is that right? That's correct. It's a, it's right. present only in the endosome. So, the virus gets in by some other route. And then in the endosome, it binds to NPC1, and that leads to fusion of the viral and the endosomal membrane. Nuclear capsid then gets in the cytoplasm. It's kind of a unique way of, uh, uh, of fusion, the fusion happening in the endosome, which by itself is not unique, but catalyzed by binding uh, with this receptor. So then we have the nuclear capsid in the cytosol, which of course is the negative strand RNA, the polymerase, and that gives rise to the synthesis of the viral mRNAs, which are translated into proteins. Uh, and then at some point, you have... Uh, well, first you have to make more minus strands. So you make a full-length plus strand, which is then copied to make more minus strands. Uh, and then uh, eventually glycoproteins are put into the plasma membrane uh, and the assembly begins. The nucleocapsids assemble with the uh, M proteins and these bud out. What I find interesting is that the nucleocapsids um, form parallel to the plasma membrane and then they bud out that way. So I have a question, Vincent. You've put this replication figure in that looks like it's from the textbook. Yeah. And there's a gray heart kind of in the middle. <laughs> yeah. what, what's, what's that about? Exactly. And then a miracle happens. It's a right. <laughs> Mir- <laughs> gray heart. It's funny that it looks like a heart. That is the um, mm. these, these sites of, uh, these are inclusion bodies, basically. Sites of RNA synthesis and nucleocapsid assembly. It's probably labeled in the original, I would hope. But I would look, make sure it is. Yeah, so there you go. That's Ebola virus. Hmm. One of our outbreak viruses. Any, any other comments on Ebola viruses? You have a blog on this from 2012 about the difference between Ebola virus one word and Ebola virus two words. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So yeah, the, and then Jens actually wrote like two pages of comment on that blog because I, I didn't get it quite right. So if you if you want, <laughs> you should read Jens's comments, which are in the discussion section. I was just looking at it the other day, and I was appalled at how much garbage turned up in it in terms of comments. You know, people cursing at each other and saying you don't know this, you don't know that. So I deleted it all and I left Jens and a few others. Dear, dear. You know, they say that you should shut off comments after so long, because otherwise <laughs> yes. it gets really nasty. Why do people have to be nasty on blogs? Why do they have to be nasty at all? Period. Yes, that too. Yeah. The uh, the anonymity of the internet gives people the... Oh, yeah. Uh, so, some kind of... It's some kind of drug. You should read some of the reviews of my book, The Vertical Farm, and... <laughs> people get nasty. It's on, it's on Amazon. You can always tell who the person is related to a farmer not to a farmer <laughs> they don't it's, like your oh, idea they hate it they hate it they mm. just hate it anyway yeah yeah so yens made a nice long post where he clarified things and there were some people who had good discussions and actually one person said uh, i know it's a year after this post but i just wanted to say this so and and that person made good points so that's why i keep them open and i don't close them but you know i, I really need to moderate the comments more effectively because it's shocking yeah what's in there filter you have to filter as if you have time to do this. Yeah, right. This is why a lot of people just turn off comments. I just feel that as a teacher, you should take questions and comments, you know. But I understand that it's, yeah, there are lots of sites, but anyway. All right, so let's move I'm still to, not clear on the uh, the distinction amongst the different species, whether they are, uh, I mean, obviously there's going to be some sequence differences, but I don't, it's not clear to me that that's the only difference, whether they, uh, well, we already know that there is some immunological differences, right? Mm-hmm. So pathogenicity uh, how much cross reactivity is there among species or is there none? 
I, so my understanding is if you wanted to protect against all you in a vac- with a vaccine, you need to have each one. Okay. Uh, is it so, so that basically, the, that that to me gives a, a yeah. practical distinction among right. the species. They, these are, these are, are serotypes. So right. the There's Zaire, the serotypes. current vaccine that's but, being deployed, right, is made with Zaire glycoprotein, and it will not protect against the other okay. viruses. Good. But it's the main one, so that's why. All right, any other questions? We'll have Jens next week, and he would love to answer questions of any kind. Now we have a paper which was sent in by, actually sent to Rich. So I'm going to let Rich read the original letter and take the discussion because it's about vaccinia virus. And if Rich is on the show, we do vaccinia papers. And if he's not on the show, we don't do them. Exactly. <laughs> how, how could we do a vaccinia paper if he's not on the show, right? Well, I would well, probably. It would be like I, doing an adenovirus paper and with Kathy not on the yeah, show or right. some, or a polio paper with Vincent not on the show. It happens all the time. But you but, can do any of them with me on the show. All right, sorry. Go ahead, Rich. What do we got? This is from uh, Jason Mercer, who's at the uh, uh, MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology, uh, which has at, at University College in London. Hi, Rich. Hope you're doing well. I wanted to get in contact as I think we have a really nice story we put together on vaccinia virus in combination with using super resolution microscopy to map the viral membrane proteins. We found that the fusion machinery sits at the tips of virions, binding proteins largely at the sides, and that this is important for fusion efficiency. In other words, localization drives function which on a virus I think is pretty neat. It's got some really cool imaging. We solved the mystery of why A27 was thought to be a fusion protein, and I think it really begins to fulfill one of your remaining challenges listed at the end of In a Nutshell. Just a little pause there. <laughs> um, uh, along with Paula Trachtman and Nassim Musachi, some years ago, I forget exactly when it was, I think it was published as long ago as 2006, we wrote a massive review on the uh, structure and assembly of uh, pox viruses called In a Nutshell, and it had some sort of subtitle, okay? Um, and at the end of it, it's got a bunch of uh, sort of summary and conclusions of what the what the cool questions are, so... Uh, we just put the paper on bioarchive. Uh, I usually never ask these things and don't want to be cheeky, but I thought this would be a really cool story for TWIV. Of course, no expectations, just thought I'd float it your way as I think listeners might really like this kind of technology drives discovery stories. All the best, Jason. Uh, you know, a little history on Jason. He was a graduate student in Paula Trackman's lab and then did a postdoc that I think morphed into some sort of staff position um, at, uh, is it uh, EMBL where Ari Hellenius was in uh, Heidelberg? No, I think e- that's right. ETH. Okay. Zurich. Zurich. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then set up his own shop at uh, MRC in London. Okay, so I would like to start with a uh, hopefully really reasonably brief uh, summary of pox structure, pox virus structure, um, and um, a little bit on assembly to sort of set the stage for this. And I think the important thing to say here is that uh, pox virus structure is really like unusual, like no other virus structure that I can think of. Um, So these are large DNA viruses. They used to be the largest until the giant viruses came around. We're talking a couple of hundred kilobases of double-stranded DNA. Once again, the most famous pox virus is uh, smallpox. The one that's worked on in the lab is vaccinia, which is the vaccine virus that was used to vaccinate people against uh, smallpox. In structure, this thing is shaped. I, the closest thing I can think of to conjure up an image is a pillow. Okay, so it's got a it's got three distinct axes: a long axis from one end to the other of the pillow, and a broad axis from the sort of sides of the pillow, and then it. Uh, has a the thinnest ax, uh, uh, axis um, is 
perpendicular to those two. Next time you lay your head on a pillow, say, I'm laying my head on a vaccinia virus. There you go. <laughs> you got it. It's uh, surrounded by a membrane, a, a lipid bilayer membrane that is uh, chock-a-block with virus proteins. There's something like uh, 20 some odd virus proteins in the membrane. I think, uh, even more, there's a couple of those that are really the fundamental structural components of the, uh, membrane. And then there's a whole bunch of others that are functional components, most notably a complex of proteins that's important for, uh, fusion of the viral membrane with cellular membranes and another, uh, uh, not necessarily complex, but a, an assortment of proteins that are important for binding the virus to the cell. Under that membrane, inside that membrane, there's a, a core structure that's uh, usually depicted as dumbbell shaped. It's actually more like pillow shaped with indentations on uh, the two largest surfaces opposite each other. And that core is. Uh, the core wall is a proteinaceous uh, structure, and inside that is the DNA and a bunch of other proteins, including all the transcription machinery for the virus. And in the indentations that I talked about, between the core wall and underneath the virus membrane are uh, aggregates of proteins that uh, are called lateral bodies because they, since they uh, are together filling those indentations. They actually look like a structure, but I, I think of them as kind of goo proteins between the, <laughs> the core wall and the membrane that happen to fill those uh, indentations. Is that a capital G or just a small G, Richard? Uh, that's, a, that's a capital G, capital O, capital O, goo. Got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, you know, uh, it's, just a little bit about the assembly there's because uh, you know pe people may want to know okay so what about is there anything in common with what we th think about normal virus structures like in particular a, a capsid just uh was it last episode or the episode before last episode you were talking about giant viruses mm -hmm. the solution of the giant virus and the jelly roll structure right yes mm -hmm. well this is really interesting because there's a this particle uh is assembled initially as a sphere not a pillow a sphere mm. and uh it uh, assembles with uh, from ER membranes that are sort of uh, invaginated uh, into the lumen of the ER and then excised to form these uh, what start off as crescents and then spheres. And in the process, the viral proteins are added to the membrane. And then there's a scaffolding protein on the outside of the whole thing called D13. And that thing, the, the structure of that thing has just been solved. And it uh, looks like a capsid protein. It's got the jelly roll uh, motifs uh, and the whole bit. And that's uh, sort of the scaffold on the outside of the sphere, and it actually contacts the membrane proteins inside the particles. And then inside that is all of the other stuff that's going to make up the core wall and the uh, internal part of the core and the lateral bodies and everything else. And then very late in the morphogenesis, there's some magic happens that's uh, proteolysis, some proteins, a lot of proteins are cleaved. And uh, among other things, that capsid protein or the scaffolding protein, D13, leaves. It's cleaved off this thing. And this thing morphs into this pillow structure and the core structure forms inside by who knows how. And subsequently, a few more membrane proteins are added that weren't there to start with, uh, but that gives you the finished particle. Rich, is that a smooth membrane or a rough ER? Um, it's smooth ER. The, smooth ER? It's, it's is it derivative kind of, of the Golgi? Uh, I think it's derived from ER, but, I mean, well, I don't know. Upstream from that, I, I mean, don't know what. There's, there's, it, there's two kinds of ER in a regular cell, right? Rough ER and smooth ER. Smooth yeah, ER the is the Golgi. Is, Problem is, this isn't a regular cell because by the time you get around to making particles, we're talking about stuff that's going in, on inside a big virus factory. 
And the way I look at it, the virus factory is shot through with membrane that is derived from the ER. But by the time it gets into the factory and is being co-opted for this, uh, I'm not sure it resembles what you're thinking about as ER much anymore. You can identify ER proteins in it, and there's other pieces of uh, uh, that is prior to the um, insertion of the viral proteins. And there's other pieces of evidence that it's uh, ER in origin. But beyond that, I'm uh, ignorant. Is that factory heart-shaped? <laughs> no, it should be. Okay. So, and is this virus promiscuous in terms of cell type, or does it have specificity? Yes. So the um, That's what I thought. the vaccinia virus, in particular, is quite promiscuous. Right. Right. So, um, uh, this is a large structure. It's like uh, three hundred nanometers, the longest axis. So, yeah, that's right. And uh, by like 250 by 150, the other uh, two axes. So as as these things go, it's very large, and it's it's not you can't do any of the normal structural analysis on it. I mean, it's uh, it's not got regular features, um, and so it and, and you can't you know you can't crystallize it you don't really get anything out of cryo em like you would with a a regular structure um and so it's challenging not only because it's big but also because it has this unusual structure and so getting structural information on it has has been a unique challenge and that's one of the things that this paper addresses it uses um, some high-end uh, microscopy techniques to explore the structure uh, of the virus. And they focus on uh, two things in particular, uh, both of which are in the virus membrane. One is the what's called the entry fusion pro- uh, complex, which is a complex of 11 proteins. Can you believe this? This was worked out mostly uh, in the MOS lab. Um, and these proteins, uh, it's simplest thing to say, well, nine of the 11 of them are really in a complex. There are two others that are sort of peripherally associated with a complex. And if you get rid of any one of them, oh, I should say in order to get into the cells, uh, the normal way is probably macropinocytosis. We already talked about micropanocytosis. These are larger uh, vesicles that uh, uh, form as the virus binds to the uh, cell, and then these uh, there are these invaginations that in, large invaginations that uh, engulf uh, engulf the virus. And in fact, uh, Jason was uh, instrumental in figuring out uh, that process as well. No fusion uh, of lysosomes. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Eventually, so the I. So I where do the acceptance come from? Oh, that I'm sorry, that's Ebola. That, that was different. Right. So I should I should back up. The virus first has to bind, uh, and that involves uh, four proteins, all of which bind different, fairly common cell surface substituents. If you get rid of any one of those virus proteins, the virus can still bind because you need all four of them. Um, and that's a, I would say fairly nonspecific because those things are binding to very common substituents on the surface of the cells. One of those we're going to talk about, it's called D8. Um, we'll talk about another one a little bit. It's called H3. All of these have uh, go by gene names. It makes it really impossible unless you're into it. So at any rate, the virus like binds, it, Rich. <laughs> yeah, the virus binds and then it's engulfed. Uh, and then after that engulfment, uh, the virus uh, membrane fuses with the membrane of the pinocytotic vesicle, and that releases the core uh, into the cytoplasm. So this paper is about proteins involved in the binding uh, and proteins that are involved in the fusion uh, that are part of this uh, EFC or um, entry fusion complex. Right. So, go, so going into this paper, we've got we have a bunch of information about what proteins are there on the surface, and but we have a virus that is too big, essentially too big to study with the conventional structural techniques that we would use, like crystallography and cryo EM. Right. That's right. 
So, and okay. back before before the discovery of the giant viruses like Mimi viruses, this when I was learning virology, this was considered a huge virus. Right. And so this, at the same time, it's it's big on the scale of viruses, but it's way small on the scale of conventional microscopy. Right. You know, so it, if you're looking a, at a, a cell, a you. If you're looking at a cell, you can see cytoskeleton, you can see mitochondria, you can see nucleus and that kind of stuff. That's because that's pretty big. Now we're down to something that's way, way smaller than a mitochondria, right? And so distinguishing substructures in this is is tough, but it's not small enough or regular enough to crystallize so that you can use uh, sort of atomic methods. So Rich, so it sort of all falls in a gap with our imaging technology. Yes, exactly. Rich. Rich, what was the attraction of pox viruses for you? For me? Yeah, you. How did you get involved in this, considering that this is such a difficult subject? Is so that- I came into virology in general through the back door, right? Yeah. I'm a molecular biologist right. using RNA. viruses as simple genetic systems to study molecular biology. And what I really liked was that this thing had a, an entirely self-contained uh, transcription replication system. Got it. Okay, so it did. It made its own RNA polymerase, its own capping enzyme, poly A polymerase, all the rest of that stuff, and it seemed to me that that would provide genetic access into all those. I could make mutants of the virus to knock out, for example, the capping enzyme and ask questions about what capping was about. Okay. That was the initial hook for me, right. and then of course once you're hooked, <laughs> he swallowed the hook. He <laughs> swallowed swall- <laughs> the whole thing. We should introduce this paper at this point, right? Yeah. So. Oh, we have a paper. Oh. Yes, yeah. we have a. Well, it's a, it's a bioarchive preprint. We should first of all yeah. say that. Uh, yeah. Let's do authors. It is a bioarchive preprint, so this has not been formally peer reviewed. Um, I had another uh, email from Jason saying that it is under review in Nature Microbiology. I think I remember that correctly. Um, so it is uh, currently under uh, formal review. First uh, authors uh, co-contributing are Robert Gray and David Albrecht. And then there's Karina Beerley, Gary Cohen, uh, Ricardo and Henriquez, and uh, Jason Mercer. You know what I found uh, interesting? Well, not really, but a little bit. That <laughs> it's formatted and it's a bioarchive. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they must have done that themselves, right? Uh, I don't. I'm not familiar most of the bioarchive bio PDFs we download are just typescripts, yeah. right? Okay. So they must have formatted this, this and is, I appreciate it because it's easier to read, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My my guess is that they formatted it for the journal they're submitting it to, which Rich just said is Nature Microbiology. Um, and since bioarchive has this open concept, uh, if you formatted it for something, you can go ahead and upload it in that format. Um, so these folks, by the way, are at the MRC, University College London, um, and University of Pennsylvania, and the Francis Crick Institute in London. Uh, in order to get at these problems, what they've, they've been doing is using some high-end microscopic techniques. And I should uh, – uh, there's two that we're going to dis, uh, discuss. One is called – let me get down here uh, – SIM, Structured Illumination Microscopy. Uh, and in order to interpret the data out of that, they use a software package called Virus Mapper. Uh, and another that uh, I believe they developed. Uh, and another is the technique is called DSTORM, which stands for Direct Stochastic Optical Reconstruction Microscopy. There's a mouthful. Mm. Um, and they do uh, some uh, interpretation of those structures using a software package called Voroni Tessellation. It's my favorite. Uh-huh. Yeah, the SR, SR <laughs> Tessler software applies Voroni, Vor, Voronoi Tessellation. Vor, which Voronoi. There's a, the Wikipedia page on this is actually, unlike most um, math Wikipedia pages that I've gone to, this uh, particular one is pretty good and is readable. I mean, the others okay, might be good. the others might be good, but they're not readable to me. So this one, uh, you can kind of wade through and um, and figure out what Vor- Voronoi tessellation is and why that applies. Uh, so for the purposes of uh, TWIV and for me being pretty uh, ignorant uh, in this stuff, I would summarize these by saying uh, that they are both 
still optical microscopy techniques. That is, you're looking at light, and they're doing fluorescence microscopy in both cases. Uh, but the uh, they're using uh, specialized microscopes and specialized uh, software to uh, process the images to get higher resolution than is what is uh, normally available. Uh, and in the case of using SIM, the structured in illumination microscopy, uh, they are processing the images with this virus mapper software that they developed that actually – uh, takes a whole bunch of images and, in effect, averages them, okay? So they come up with the images that you see in the end are a model. They are not individual uh, viruses, but a model of what uh, the structure looks like. And uh, the D-Storm uh, uh, is a different method that has to do with uh, the ability to uh, uh, excite and quench the floor very rapidly in sequence, which somehow impacts on the resolution you can get. Personally, I don't know how. Uh, but the, there the uh, images that you get out are actually of individual uh, particles. Right. Uh, anybody and else these two have more to say about those techniques? These two techniques are complementary. Yes. So there's, just, uh, there's information you can get out of SIM that you can't get out of D-Storm and vice versa. Right. So, uh, the uh, data in the paper, with that long wrap, the data in the paper itself is really fairly straightforward to uh, go through. Um, they first use uh, SIM to model the distribution of the proteins in the entry fusion complex or one of the proteins involved in binding on the surface of the virion. And the models they come up with, uh, looking at six different uh, entry fusion proteins, is that they are at the uh, ends of this pillow. Not on the long sides, but on the, uh, not on the long slides, but on the, on the short ends of the pillow. Um, and the uh, uh, binding proteins seem to be clustered uh, on the edges of the long axes. And in fact, I had some more. The, the thing is they don't, they only show you, uh, they only model images in this paper of looking down on the pillow, not on the edge of the pillow. And it looks like these things are on the edge because it's hard to get images of uh, looking at directly at the edge of the pillow. Cause when the virions sit down, they have a tendency to sit down on the, on the broadest, uh, edge. So getting what they call a sagittal image of this mm -hmm. thing sitting on the edge is more difficult. But, uh, Jason in, uh, other correspondence says he thinks that it looks like it's on the edge, whether you're looking at a sagittal or a frontal, uh, projection. And so he thinks the binding proteins are actually in sort of a band around uh, the pillow, uh, not at the edges. So they also go, uh, go a little further and ask what happens if you um, knock out any one of the entry fusion proteins. And what happens is that now these become scattered all over the virion. The, the others become scattered all over the uh, virion. So the idea is that if you disrupt any one component of this complex, you're probably disrupting the complex generally so that it's at least so that it's no longer uh, clustered uh, at the end of the, uh, of the virion. By contrast, if you uh, uh, disrupt the entry fusion complex, uh, entry fusion complex proteins, the binding proteins are unperturbed. Okay, so they're saying that a part of being a complex has to do with a clustering at the end of the uh, of the virion. They have a lovely image, a drawing of this, summarizing mm -hmm. this, which really yes. If this is right, since really this helps. is on BioArchive, you can go see it. It's really beautiful. They have the wild type, and you know the disruptions, which show the big difference. It's lovely, and this is very different from the way. Uh, at least I've usually visualized viral glycoproteins. I think of these yeah. things as just being being kind of swimming around on the surface and they're yeah. wherever they are. And yep. uh, But in this case, you've got this very distinctive clustering of particular proteins by function. Yeah, of course, right. most viruses have just a few, right? Right. <laughs> and not so many, so. Yeah, so, I, I look at this and think about 
the ways that proteins are sorted on the surface of the cell and all of the mechanisms that our cells use for that and have tried to figure out how that might apply to these viruses, how the viruses could keep the proteins in different locations. And I didn't really come up with much of anything. Right. Rich. Kathy, 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 you were. Well, I was just going to say that. So if it, the virus binds by what's on the side, then do you envision that it kind of then rolls over to mm-hmm. the end to uh, do well, the fusion? Well, it, ta- it usually gets taken up in a vesicle. Mm. Okay. So that's going to change sort of the relationship between the virus membrane and the cell membrane. So I don't know if the virus has to kind of roll over to do the fusion or whether, in essence, the wrapping of the membrane around the virus in the vesicle mm. will bring mm-hmm. the membrane in in proximity to the fusion proteins. I would imagine the latter. This this image and this, this study reminds me very much of the early studies using a phase microscopy to study the entry of merozoites from malaria parasites into red cells because they first come in on their side and then they go stand on their head and they're called apicomplexa because they have glands inside these or they look Mm. like glands. They secrete substances which deform the membrane and allow the thing to go inside the red cell. This has got some analogies here in terms of uh, how it behaves. And actually, they uh, they point out in the introduction that some of their uh, uh, earlier studies using these enhanced microscopic uh, techniques on the binding and entry of the virus uh, showed that the virus seemed to bind on its edge, uh, but that uh, fusion took place uh, with uh, from the ends of the virus. I should point out that under special conditions, probably to some minor extent uh, under natural conditions, but uh, under conditions in the laboratory that we'll come to, uh, you can cause the virus fusion event to happen at the plasma membrane. Hmm. And usually that involves exposing uh, the bound virus uh, on the cells to low pH. Right. So if it doesn't bind, but it's still got the ability to fuse, then um, that makes good sense because some of the virus particles must come down directly on their head to begin with. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good point. So it segregates the binding, uh, and the fusion in an appropriate fashion. Right. So what is the infectivity of a virus that's been altered? So it can't bind, but it can fuse. Uh, percentage of virus particles, right? That's hard to do because the binding is really complicated. As I say, there's four different binding proteins and I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at that stuff for a long time. I don't. I think there are publications with knocking out all four binding proteins, but I can't cite you chapter and verse, and I don't know. Th- you know, I can't really answer your question. Well, uh, how about as a timing experiment? You know, when you put them into cell culture to begin with, uh, and you don't have a binding, but you have a pen- but you have a fusion event, uh, the timing must be off, right? So I can, would I would think so. So you yeah. can just rescue particles from the supernatant and find out how many are left at each time point and find out what the time difference is, at least, versus you have the full complement of both proteins or you just have one set of mm. proteins. I bet you get a difference, but I bet you they all go in eventually. Write a grant, Dixon. You got it. I'm, you know, <laughs> beyond the pale, as they would say. <laughs> beyond the pale. Beyond the pale. I like that. So at any rate, then they go on to uh, uh, analyze the same situation using a D-storm. And uh, now you're looking at individual uh, particles. And they take it a step further uh, using this tessellation technique that, in in essence, if I understand it correctly, and Alan obviously has looked into this, so maybe you'll have some comment. (laughs) In essence, takes the data and (laughs) divides individual particles uh, up into... Uh, segments uh, on on the surface and asks how much fluorescence or how much of this uh, protein that they're probing is in each one of those segments. And it's a way of figuring out the degree to which the protein clusters on the surface and where it clusters. Yes. Right. So the Voronoi tessellation is that you, you take a planar surface and you define some number of arbitrary points on it and then you divide the surface up uh, around each of those points so each point uh, it is as a surface around it of, of a boundary of all the points that are um, 
uh, of all all of the section of that surface that is closest to that point. So it's a way of subdividing the surface, and they're they're dividing this up to see how things are clustering essentially. So A twenty seven looks like it's a spacer program protein. Yeah, we're getting there. Don't right. jump ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th- I <laughs> thought it was on the same page. Hey. No. Uh, uh, so, so basically with the uh, first blush of this D-storm and Voronoi tessellation technique, we get essentially the same answer, but now resolved on uh, individual virions, where if you knock out any one protein of the entry fusion complex, uh, the entry fusion complex is no longer uh, localized uh, to the tips of the virion. Um, but we, and uh, it has no effect on the localization of the binding protein. Uh, however, we get uh, a little more information in that uh, the uh, binding protein, we now uh, see that the binding protein exists not sort of uniformly distributed in a band around the virus, but in clumps, in clusters. Uh, And in fact, the entry fusion complex is the same way. It exists in clusters uh, at the tips. And I'm looking at this and seeing that you still have clusters when you knock of entry fusion complex, when you knock out any one of the proteins, but they're no longer located at the tips. So they probably still form these uh, mm. complexes that are clusters, but they're now lost all over the virion rather than being uh, specifically localized to the tips. And they're really small. There are not very many of them, no. right? So No. And, it's, and that, uh, that might start to get at how in the world they're clustering. It seems like there must be a way to make the little clusters and then put them all together as big clusters. Yeah. Could be clusters last stand for that matter. Oh, <laughs> so uh, now we come to A27. A27 is another uh, kind of sort of membrane protein, uh-huh. uh, and it's been a mystery for a long time. This is a protein that does not have a transmembrane domain and is added after uh, the removal of the scaffolding protein that I described earlier. So it's one of the last things that goes onto the hmm. uh, uh, membrane, and it's added in a fashion so that it um, uh, sticks to uh, one of the major structural membrane proteins that we haven't actually talked about. It's an integral membrane protein that forms uh, part of the structures, not part of the entry fusion complex or anything else. This protein historically has uh, had a lot of different functions in the morphogenesis uh, and function of the virus, one of which is that it seemed as if uh, it was a fusion protein, and yet it doesn't look like a fusion protein. Uh, you got to really stretch it to uh, make it seem like it has any uh, uh, intrinsic fusion activity uh, of its own. Um, and so they do some experiments where they knock out that protein uh, and show and do assays for this fusion from without. So you bind virus to the cells, you expose them to low pH, and under those circumstances, you can get uh, fusion at the surface that's manifested as uh, a fusion of the cells. Because if you have something that'll uh, that's at least bivalent that'll uh, fuse to adjacent uh, plasma membranes to itself, you wind up fusing the cells. And you can analyze that microscopically because you can see multinucleated fusion products. And they confirm that uh, if you lack this protein, uh, you lack fusion. And then they take that one step further and they use their enhanced microscopic techniques, both SIM and D-STORM, to look at this. And what they find is that when you knock out A27, the entry fusion complex now is no longer distributed to the tips, but scattered all over the place. It doesn't have any effect on uh, the uh, uh, binding proteins, but they're pretty broadly distributed to start with anyway. So... As Dixon said, it looks like this A27 protein is important for imposing or at least maintaining this uh, fine structure of proteins in the membrane. I guess the bottom line on this paper, in a, well, one bottom line on this paper, is that there is a fine structure 
to the proteins in the membrane uh, of this virus with the entry fusion complex at the tips and the uh, binding proteins more as a, a band around the rest of the virus. And one of the proteins that appears to be involved in imposing that organization is this A27. If you get rid of A27, you'll lose that organization. So A27 looks like a dimer to me, right? Uh, I don't know. Look at the dimer. Uh, is that, uh, is there, it looks like a trimer to me. No, 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 dimer because eight twenty eight seventeen is its. Yeah, it could it's be its a trimer, mate. Yeah. I, I don't know. I could think it a isn't. I actually, I think it probably is a trimer. Yeah, it looks, looks to sure. me. Looks to me, there are three there. Yep. Well, yep. eight a seventeen, which is that red pepper like protein <laughs> diagram, it stays <laughs> in the membrane for the for the a twenty seven minus yeah. virion, right? Yeah. So now, what happens if you took just a twenty seven? And in solution with this wild uh, A27 minus, would A27 mm. now bind to A17 and reorder the structure on the membrane? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Because I don't yeah. know. Not much is known about the uh, mechanism uh, by which these proteins are added, whether uh, later on, whether it's. Uh, you know, some sort of directed thing or spontaneous. Yeah. Let me see here. You yeah, should call yeah. Jason and tell him you want to be a postdoc. You're a fire <laughs> yeah, That's a great experiment. Sabbatical, please. Sabbatical. <laughs> um, uh, let me... Uh, MRC let is a great just, place to work, by the way. Okay. Uh, uh, here we go. A27. I'm looking at nutshell. <laughs> okay. Oops. A27. Forms a disulfide bonded trimer. Trimer. Mm -hmm. Anchored yeah, to the MV membrane via strong interaction with A17. So there's so, a dominant antigen. Three, three A27 molecules plus an A17 molecule. Right. Well, the, the, the trimer is bound to the membrane via a contact with uh, A17. the A17. Inter integral A17 protein. So if you if you purified the trimers of A twenty seven and then right. added them to the A twenty seven minus right. Right. virus, what, what would happen? What would happen? Could you what could you happen? recover the thing? Yep, good question. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, well, it had been known, and they uh, uh, confirm it and elaborate on it that in the A seven twenty seven uh, minus virus, uh, you're uh, deficient in entry and fusion, and uh, since the major thing that's happening is the redistribution of the entry fusion complex. The implication of that is that this clustering of the uh, 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 entry fusion complex at the tips of the virion is important for its function. So if you and had an, I'm sorry, if you had an antibody ahead. against the trimer, A27, would that prohibit the binding of the virus? Uh, I do not know. I, 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 can, I can't believe that, prohibit. I can't believe that that experiment hasn't been done. Um, so I don't know if, uh, the question then is, are anti a 27 antibodies neutralizing? Right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And I don't know the answer to that. Right. Um, they actually, uh, uh, break the, um, uh, action of a 27, uh, down even further. Um, they show that, uh, the virus, uh, the A27 minus can, uh, virus can bind and it can do what's called hemifusion, which is remember a lipid bilayer is a bilayer. It's got, uh, two leaflets and the first part of a fusion process is the fusion of the outer leaflets of the virus and the cell respect, uh, respectively to each other called hemifusion. So you've gotten half of the fusion process. And uh, the A27 minus virus can do that, uh, but it's more defective in the uh, full fusion. And I guess that uh, uh, means that the uh, that's um, uh, implies that the entry fusion complex, uh, it's a major part of its activity is in uh, going from hemifusion to full fusion. So another question arises then, if you had the trimer of A27 in solution and you put it in cell culture first and then put the virus in, what would happen? Uh, good question. Don't know. Yeah, would it roll. competitively? Yeah, roll. In Don't roll. I'm, listen, there's the grant. <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess to summarize, we have a virus whose structure is very difficult to uh, parse out. 
Uh, membrane virus is very difficult to parse out. We have enhanced microscopic techniques that have been used to show that there is a substructure to the membrane of this virus where fusion proteins are located at the tips and binding proteins uh, at the edges, uh, and that that organization is maintained by uh, at least one other protein, uh, membrane protein A27 uh, in the virus. And if that structure is disrupted so that now uh, uh, the entry fusion complex is more evenly distributed around the virus, fusion is compromised. So that sublocalization is important for the function of the yeah, virus. Rich, you may have mentioned. So A27 minus will bind, though. Is that correct? Yes. So you don't need to have this clustering of the binding proteins in order to get uh, binding. Yeah, uh, apparently not. Yeah. Okay, so they're pretty broadly distributed to start with anyway. Yeah, okay? I mean, it may be that the real key is the fusion concentration. Right. Could you make a virus particle that only had A27 as its binding proteins, get rid of the rest, just A27 in the membrane? I don't think so, because it, it associates... Uh, specifically with by virtue of the, with, yeah, A17. So, right? okay. And, so if you have those two proteins, just those two, because there are others there too, right? Um, there's right, DA, A27 and A17. Yes. There's, uh, there's a bunch A13. of 13. So if you only had A27 plus A17, would that be enough? To do what? Bind? To bind. It says that, let's see. No. It says something in the, in the introduction no. about this, uh, so that, there goes my. It grant. says the binding proteins, the four binding proteins, are not individually essential. Right. However, they all bind different stuff. Yeah, but right? A seventeen. If you get rid of A twenty seven, it looks as though that does have a big effect. It says in the, even A twenty seven are not individually essential. So if you could take it out, it will still bind. But A twenty A twenty seven without A twenty seven, you can still bind. Yeah. The problem is in getting full fusion. You right. can even get amifusion. Right? That's, I, 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 yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's it redistributes because, the fusion protein. Yeah, exactly. Right. Sorry, exactly. That's right. Sorry. Exactly. That's right. So it w the, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to, uh, you know, as long as I have this vision of this membrane in my mind, in particular, we haven't talked much about, we talked a little bit about A17. The two major structural uh, proteins are in the membrane are A17 that interacts with another one called a14, and in my mind, they make a kind of a, 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 a hairnet, a lattice around the virus that's uh, embedded uh, in the lipid. And all of these other proteins are obviously in uh, 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 stuck to this somehow as well. Get this. You can extract the lipid from this particle, <laughs> um, and it loses infectivity. Uh, but all of these membranes, m the vast majority of these membrane proteins are all still there. And then you can add back the lipid and restore infectivity. Mm. Wow. Okay? So this is not your typical membrane. What if at right? that point you added polyethylene glycol as a substitute, just like you do for cell fusion to make hybridomas? Would that substitute for all those lipids? Uh, no. Uh, they've tried a bunch of different things. Uh, ones and I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's phosphatidylethanolamine that's the major one, but I'm oh, okay. I could be I could be wrong. There's one particular lipid that's really important and will do the whole job. So it has an anchor sequence then uh, into the lipid membrane. What does the proteins? Not A27. No, right? but some of them do. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, all of the all of the entry A, uh, A14, A17. Uh, all of the entry fusion complex proteins, all of the binding proteins have transmembrane domains. Right. Okay. So, Rich, so from that point of view, they look like typical membrane proteins. Oh, okay. So, Rich, you said that yeah. one particular lipid would um, do the job of reconstituting um, yes. the lipids. So that kind of implies that the clustering is not based on lipid rafts because you need to have uh, different right. kinds of lipids there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, that's that's correct. Uh, and I hope if I've misspoken with any of this, my Fox buddies <laughs> will send us some oh, mail. Trust me. Sure they will. will. <laughs> I, so well, I, I'm expecting some follow-up from Jason, at least. Yes. Rich, just one question. Most viruses appear to not do this, although maybe no one's looked, right? You know, 
most viruses have one or two different glycoproteins. So what's the function of having this polarization? Is that a, is that a byproduct of this pillow-shaped uh, virus and the need to direct the, the domains? In some uh, way, so they, 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 uh, uh, this, I think they have some uh, experiments to address this towards the end. And they talk about HIV because HIV has a, a fairly low concentration of its binding and fusion proteins on the surface. And it's thought in that case that in order to really get efficient binding and fusion, there has to be some clustering of those proteins in, in sort of subclusters on the, mm. on the virion. And they do some modeling here uh, in the last part of uh, figure four, uh, talking about the effect of clustering on fusion. And basically the bottom line is that they think that you have to have a certain concentration of these things somewhere in order to get efficient fusion. At least that's the message that I got out of it. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, it would be worthwhile to go and look at some other viruses now with these techniques and see if you're getting clustering. Right. But there's two things. There's, there's you know, attachment-induced clustering or what we have here is these viruses are already clustered but as they're made. It's not right. attachment induced in any way. Right. Yeah. And it, well, it makes me, uh, um, when you're talking about attachment induced clustering, you're, if I'm not mistaken, talking, are you, uh, talking about what Brianne was talking about is basically, we ordinarily think of membranes yes, exactly. as having these proteins in them that can move around. Right, exactly. right, exactly, and swim around in the membrane. So, if you attach, that might induce movement of proteins in the membrane to cluster. And and basically, uh, from what I've said about the membrane around the pox virus, I think it's a more static structure. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. uh, and things aren't going to move around. So this has been uh, sort of prefabricated so that that clustering is is built into the mature virion. Although, you know, if you think of a spherical virus. Right, influenza or your favorite, maybe um, not as straightforward to get this cluster. Maybe there's right? more cluster. Yeah, it may not be, and maybe if you subjected some of those viruses to this level of resolution microscopy, you'd find clustering that you didn't anticipate. Yeah, I think that's. Well, I'm not idea. sure this this method. I think is kind of a specialized thing for looking at something the size of a pox virus, right? I mean, if you if you had a virus that was small enough that you could study it with crystallography or with um, electron microscopy, uh, you know, cryo-EM or something like that, you'd probably use those techniques rather than this, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, except that I uh, typically those aren't applied to membrane viruses, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. Membrane viruses yeah. have a tendency to be, at least by conventional techniques, what they call polymorphic, right? Mm. Uh, they uh, assume a bunch of different shapes. I'm not sure what they actually look like, whether they have a more regular structure in their native conditions uh, in the cell. You do make a point in that something like flu is a lot smaller than something like a pox virus. So you may be getting down to uh, a, a particle that where these techniques as they exist now won't even be good enough. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you can't apply the sort of uh, atomic techniques um, like crystallography or cryo-EM because there's right. the structures are too irregular. So Jason, I, um, when you're writing your follow-up, um, let us know what the <laughs> resolution limit of this is and if you could use it for a smaller envelope virus. We would love to read the, love to read the referee while, while comments. While you're answering the comments from reviewer number three, I mean, Dixon. Exactly. Number, <laughs> <Yeah>. number seven. <laughs> I have several comments. One is that uh, influenza can also have a filamentous shape, so maybe we shouldn't rule out yeah, the possibility right. that there's, there's some polarity. Um, and I, I'm a little... Uh, disappointed to know that it's already been submitted because I had some suggestions for Jason as to how to make it clearer to read. Um, but he can still email me and I can tell him <laughs> that, what those are. All right. Um, so, Journal of Twiv. Yes. Yeah. Journal of Twiv. Thank you, uh, Rich. Sure. Oh, the other thing I did want to say is that the, the sort of, you know, when you look at something and you think it's uh, – Maybe everything's symmetric with respect to how these membrane proteins are, are arranged, but now maybe it, it's no longer symmetric. Reminds me of the uh, portal proteins for some of the icosahedral viruses or or even yeah. herpes viruses. So that, you know, um, 
in assembly, although it seems to be very symmetrical, there's actually the portal that's different about it. And so this kind of reminded me of that, but at the other end here at the entry attachment phase. That is, you know, as a non-virologist to this august body, uh, I, you know, I envision viruses budding off the surface like um, HIV virus, for instance. Are, are, are other viruses released at cell death that have nothing to do with budding or escape? They just leave as soon as the cell dies, like malaria, for instance, does as a protozoan. Uh, non- non-envelope viruses can do that, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Cells break. So the, got the, this, uh, I've got this lipid paper for you. Um, the, you <laughs> so the the extraction of lipid is irreversible. I mean, it is reversible. Um, uh, they tested reactivation with uh, uh, individual phospholipids: uh, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylinositol, lysolethacin, sphingolomyelin, and uh, something acyl bismono acyl glycerophosphate. And the only thing that worked was phosphatidylserine. <laughs> <laughs> so we. Draw envelope viruses, right? With the like a protein is all regularly arrayed, right? And there's mm-hmm. no, I mean, for many of them, there's just one, but often there's two. And I wonder, are there clusters? And I don't right. know of any experiments that have been done. So last night I wrote a blog post about this, and I initially used the picture of influenza virus that the CDC has produced. And I took it out because it shows a little clustering. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows neuraminidases in one place, and then the HA is distributed. And I don't know what that's based on. So I, I it substituted it with a drawing from our textbook that just shows them randomly because I wanted to make this point that, that we've been discussing here. But I just wonder if— Well, not uh, randomly, but evenly. Evenly, evenly spaced, right? And in fact, I had used that word in my blog initially, Alan, and I took it out because I realized that wasn't the right word either. But um, it, 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 go ahead. I was going to say with HIV, people talk about the cl- there must be some clustering needed because there might be so many defective um, yeah. envelope particle right. or envelope proteins. And so it's a matter of getting uh, a good concentration of um correctly made proteins. Yeah. Um, but that's the only other place I've really heard this discussed. And I so want to need more cluster function studies. <laughs> I want to emphasize <laughs> yeah. that there's two ideas here. We've mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. One is that you have the pre-clustered viruses like vaccinia virus, apparently, right? They come out of the cell and the proteins are clustered. And then you have the possibility that in other viruses, maybe binding induces some kind of cluster, mm-hmm. right? Which would be hard to f- figure out by these methods, I guess. So, Rich, how many out of a, a million particles that are produced per cell or something like that, how many of those particles are actually infectious? Uh, you uh, On a good day, you can do one in 10. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I one always I always wonder about this because, in uh, matter of fact, this goes back to an old exam question that I used to have that was <laughs> really a monster. But um, uh, in order to measure the particle to infectivity ratio of a virus, you have to purify it. Right. Mm-hmm. And you might damage it when you purify it. Sure, sure. Okay? Yep. So I think, and, you know, in some viruses, it's fairly obvious. You can do, do a, uh, even on a, a crude preparation of virus, I think. Well, some viruses, they obviously make empty viruses and that kind of stuff. And you can, and you can see how you would get uh, defective uh, particles. Uh, at any rate, uh, you can get preparations of vaccinia where uh, uh, one in 10 particles are I- I infectious. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you could even do better than that. All right. Shall we move on? Sure. I, the, the only other thing is that I want to see where these microscopic techniques are going to go. I mean, you can see you'll, you be, know, around. you'll be around <laughs> 20 years from now. What are we going to be looking at? You know, we'll see. We'll let's keep twiving and we'll find out. Keep yeah. on twiving. I'll be 80. I'll be 86. You know that keep on trucking. I'll be 90. <laughs> um, Nobody's going to want to listen. I'll be to recycling 90 year olds talking. <laughs> I'll, I'll be recycling. Gotta, I'm sure of this. I'll be a little younger than that. Yes, you can carry the, yes. carry the torch. Carry the torch. Carry the torch. 
All right, let's do some email. Heather writes, greetings, esteemed doctors. I just had to drop you a line to thank you for mentioning my Instagram comment in your last episode. You probably don't realize this, but VeggiePie42, my Instagram name, is in fact the same lucky fangirl who inspired one of the main show topics for TWIV354, The Cat in the Heart. It's me, Heather. Hello again. (laughs) My FIV positive cat, Gimli, now age six, is still doing very well, and I really cannot thank you enough for being so generous with your time in that episode. I felt like I'd hit the lotto twice when you mentioned me again in TWIV505. It really is like meeting your favorite celebrity. I was even more thrilled to hear you'd be exploring the intersection of art and science in your (laughs) upcoming episode. I think love when science is able to inform and enrich art, and I can't can't wait to hear your discussion. (laughs) If I manage to get this email to you in time, I have a rather self-serving listener pick though I do believe it will be of interest to Dr. De Pommier. This is a blog I contribute to my local co-op, and she gives a link for that. I write about a different produce item every couple of weeks. All right. I'm just getting started over there and could really use a twiv bump. <laughs> also, I am avidly re-listening to past episodes right now, trying to get a bingo so I can win principles of virology. <laughs> Good luck to everyone else doing the same. Thank you again for all that you do to educate and inspire. Perhaps today I can cross three mentions on TWIV off my bucket list. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think no one is going to submit a bingo. That's what I feel. I think it's too much work to listen to old episodes again. But that's just my uh, thought. So I, I, I wanted to just chat for a few minutes, Dixon. Your, your pick on TWIV 505 yes. was this uh, article – Unexpected intersection between art and science from UCLA is a video, yep. and I looked at it. Yep. And so here's the question. Sure. I know there is an art to science. There is. Right? But is science art itself? <laughs> if you want to try to define what art is, I'm not going to do that because no. Oh, I that. thought you were. <laughs> no, no. None of the artists, no artist can do that. If you've, if you've seen interviews of famous artists in the past, and they've asked them directly, point blank, you know, what is art? They'll just laugh. Because really, what art is, is an, is an expression of your passion for form, for color, for content. And All creativity, those, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. right, of course oh, it right, is. So then science is art, And right? it's contrived. It's contrived. It's not random. It's Even though the Dadaists thought that that was what they were saying, it's not true. They were all highly studied uh, events that they thought about and and remodeled and did and so uh before the show started we had a discussion about matisse because he happens to be my favorite favorite artist matisse was a scientist and the reason why i know this is that he conducted experiments and the reason why i know that is because the cone sisters who were famous sisters back in the 1930s traveled to europe and collected art and they uh, associated with gertrude stein and people like that and they supported through their philanthropy the artists that we now know are very famous people today, you know, like Cezanne and uh, Picasso and um, uh, Matisse and, and then lots of others too. And when you see someone with a work ethic like Matisse, uh, and he's, he's got videos of this, he's actually been photographed, uh, you know, filmed, creating his art. He starts with an idea, and he doesn't know where the idea comes from, and neither do the scientists, I think, but he has a question. And, and I think that's the essence of science or art or mm. art science, science art, depending on, you have to have a question. And then the question just keeps leading to more answers, right? What does the capsid of pox viruses do? And what's it made out of? And it's as soon as you ask a question, you can try to find an answer for it. So Matisse had this, um, it's kind of a built in aesthetic of what he thought his art should be. And he couldn't get it at, at, at a single sitting or at one shot. He experimented with shapes, colors, and uh, content. And in, and you can see the collection that the Cone Sisters came back with at the uh, Baltimore Fine Arts Museum. They have some of his experiments that he did in sculpting, for instance, where he started with the head of something, anything. It was the head of a person, obviously. But the end sculpture it was based on all of the forms preceding it. But every time he did one, he made a slight change. And that slight change told him he was getting closer to his required result of, of eliciting some kind of a feeling when you see the art. And and I think we just discussed 
what a cell looks like and what a virus particle looks like and what the what the capsid might look like and what the membrane on the outside might look like. You want to visualize this. You want to see it. You want to be impressed with its symmetry or asymmetry or its ability to do something. And I think artists want to interpret the world around them through um, their own expression of their ability to control paint or metals or marble or any of those other things. And they're all they're doing experiments the whole time. They're looking for the right brushes. They're looking for the right chisels. They're looking for the right kinds of combinations of paint. They're doing experiments. And so I don't think at that point you can't say there's a difference because it's the same process. They're asking questions and they're getting. Yeah, but they're doing it for themselves or for to show other people. Some. It varies. Because we do. What do we do experiments for? We don't care. Questions. No, well, we, but we don't do them for anybody else. We do them for ourselves. Every one of us. Well, I think it differs. Some. People want to solve a problem for the greater good, and others are curious and so forth. Uh, if, if you ask the guy next door, Steve Goff, and he's a good friend of both of ours now, and ask him why he does science, and he says because he loves it. There's no other reason. Okay. It, just, it gives yeah. him great satisfaction yeah. of going home and just studying a problem and coming back and working on it and getting an answer to it. And he doesn't care who reads it. I mean, look at his publication list, and you can see – a, a, vi a, a cancer that spreads from mollusks by the water. Mm -hmm. And that's who the hell would have worked on that, right? But he did because he found that interesting. And so I think it's, it's just a matter of curiosity. And some of the artists are stuck in one theme and they get marginalized, basically. But if you look at the work of someone like Picasso or Matisse or even Cezanne, but Cezanne was a little more narrow, um, their art evolved with their curiosity and as they aged and, and accomplished more and more their art became more expressive of a broader interest in the world that they lived in and they were trying to show that to either themselves or to you or they didn't really care i mean some of them didn't, didn't yeah. give a damn like salvador dali didn't actually care who who saw his art but what a technician i mean he he was in art school for three years in spain and he learned how to draw a potato so that you couldn't tell it apart from a real potato. And at that point, you know, you're laughing, but that's, that's when he knew he was an artist. Before that, he had no idea. He says, but if I can't draw a potato, I can't draw anything. Well, I've heard Picasso say that. Right? He said he had to learn how to draw yeah. perfectly before he could break everything down. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Dolly was, was famous for having said, if you're seeking perfection, forget it. You'll never achieve it. <laughs> it's never been achieved. No one can achieve perfection. So Isn't that in the eye of the beholder? Yeah. I mean, right. it's, it's, but. I, I understand your points. I never thought of myself as an artist. What do other people think? Well, what about expressing your data? I mean, if you come to expressing yeah, I suppose. a, a nice result, graph, right. and then you look at the most boring line graphs and charts and number tables and all this crap, that's all been supplanted by visuals. Look at yeah. the paper we just reviewed. This paper had so many visuals in it, you couldn't help but understand what was going on because you didn't have to read the text. You just looked at the pictures and you could say, oh, yeah, he well, did this. I, and you know, I that. agree that the product of, right? of science can be art, you know, in the form of visuals of different sorts. I was just curious about the, the process itself. And you've told me your answer. Does, does anyone else have a thought? Come on, Kathy, you're an I, artist. I have, a, I have a couple of thoughts. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, first of all, when we talk about artists doing experiments, I think of Monet. Okay. And uh, painting the Rouen Cathedral a hundred times. <laughs> sure. Or painting haystacks a hundred times. Oh, yeah. All the different lights. Or Leonardo da Vinci, for time. God's yeah. sakes, what an experimenter. I mean, Actually, was... Leonardo is a great, a great example of the crossover between yeah. uh, art and science. Or art uh, is science. In, for you know, to me, sort of the, the, um, the artistic part of science for me was the actual execution of the techniques. Oh. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you just, uh, it, there are very few protocols where you can just take it from the paper and follow it from start to finish and get the expected result. Mostly you have to do it. You have to practice it and work through it and pay really close attention. And there are subtle, if you're paying close attention, there are subtle things that happen that make it get better. And I think as I 
did stuff with my hands. I see myself, you know, holding tubes and pipetting stuff in, uh, and, and, and loading gels and that kind of stuff. I have a really, uh, there's a really a visceral feeling about that. Okay. Sure. Uh, that, that is, uh, that's the artist in me, I think. Right. You know, I spent three years at Rockefeller and I watched people pour over the pictures for the journal of cell biology. And they were, they were picking pictures that, that resonated with a deeper sense of whether that was science or not. These were mostly EMs that they were looking at because in those days, that's that they had a lot of EM data. And George Pilati would sit there with Christian de Duve and some other people and they would, they would go over and photograph that. Oh, there's a knife mark. Sorry. Can't take it. <laughs> there's a knife mark. For Christ's sake, you can't help and get a knife mark. And oh, yes, you can. You can just, but I can't get that second. Yes, you can. You can have to just keep trying until you get it right. And that was the art of their science. They, you know, they had perfect EMs for that journal. So I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in like that. I wanted somebody else to say something. Yes. Well, my pick um, is somewhat related to art and science as well. So I'll wait for that. But um, I would agree that to me, um, it's about the creativity part of the process that it's really just about thinking broadly and being creative. Um, and that makes science very similar to what we're, what people do in lots of types of art. I remember as a grad student, I tried to run these perfect RNA gels, right? <laughs> if, if the, if one of the segments was bent, I would redo it. And, oh, <laughs> right. It's, so, it's a, <laughs> okay. <laughs> We had a, we had a, uh, I guess I had a pick a few episodes ago that, uh, was, um, making fun of the fact that all of the images of science, uh, scientists are that they stare at things. Yes, yes, right. yes, 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 yes. Um, and yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking after that, that, you know, that's not so crazy. I used to sit there and watch gels run. Sure. Tell okay. Me. Sure. Uh, and I would sit and stare. <laughs> stare at stuff for a long time. And that's part of this mm -hmm. visceral feeling that I'm talking about that I equate with the uh, part, at, le at least in part with the art and science. And of course, Alan writing is an art. We have, no well, art. yes. Right. And I, I would, I would really take this all the way back to our, our roots as a species and discovery mm. and creation are really two aspects of the same process that has been something that we do for as far as we can tell as long as we've been humans yes and you you know you go back to uh to the cave art um right. here you've got people who are observing nature because their lives depend on it and they need to understand animal behavior and they need to understand what plants are good to eat and which ones are toxic. And they need to, to understand the change of the seasons and, and the changes in the weather. And they're, um, they're observing these things and then they want to create. And so in the process of publishing their results, they put figures in the, in, you know, in the peer reviewed literature on the wall of the cave illustrating what they've discovered about nature and a lot of it is abstract abstracted to some degree but you can tell what's going on um and that process that the, those two sides of that process are going on all the time in human life this is what we do we have a, we have this tremendous drive to discover new things and to create new things that other people can discover right and so when you say art and science, well, these are, again, these are two aspects of the same thing. We're, we're discovering things. We're creating things in both arms of, of this endeavor. Yeah. Kathy. I really have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I'll, I have a, a doctorate in philosophy, but I'm not really big on philosophical things. And I like doing science I like doing art. Are they the same? No. Are they related? Yes. That's where I'll leave it. All right. All right, let's get to picks so we can hear what Brienne has to say. <laughs> what, have <you> <laughs> what have you got, Brienne? Um, so I have an article that 
um, is in science. Um, that's called STEM Education Should Get Hacked. And hacked is an acronym um, that they use that stands for Humanities, Arts, Crafts, and Design. <laughs> um, and they uh, are looking at a National Academy of Sciences report that talks about the importance of teaching um, those humanities, arts, crafts, and design skills uh, to science students. Um, and the thing that I really found fascinating about this article was actually that it had some statistics about the frequency of scientists who also do art. Um, and I was I was just very surprised. So for example, they say that members of the National Academy of Sciences um, are about three to five times more likely uh, to have um, an avocation involving arts, craft, theater, or creative writing than average scientists. And Nobel Prize winners engage in these things 15 to 25 times the rate of average scientists. Mm. Um, so there are lots of uh, things here where people are discussing how doing art um, has an impact on their work in the sciences and how many um, scientists uh, also had uh, a background in art, giving lots of examples uh, in the past. Cool. All and right. cool. by the way, you can purchase access to that article for one day for $30. <laughs> Oh my goodness! <gasps> or you can ask somebody for. Or you can ask somebody for a copy of it. Yes, but it is paywalled. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay. that's quite oh, all right. no, 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 no. We've all picked paywalled stuff. It's not a problem. <laughs> right. Just pointing out the irony of you know they're yeah. pushing this yeah. educational yes. idea and. Alan, what do you have? I have a local pick. Um, this is uh, if you're in Massachusetts and looking for something to do on a on a rainy day. This is a blast. And I believe there are others of these types of things scattered around. So there, there's probably one local to you. There's, I'm sure there's going to be one in New York or in somewhere in the New York area, probably multiple ones, um, probably, uh, probably down in Austin, too. It is a, an escape room place. So what hmm. they do is they have these uh, – they're, they're set up in a, um, in a storefront of a um, – this particular one is in a former mill – in East Hampton. Um, and they have a few different rooms that you can pick and you go in with your group of friends. You should ideally do this with anywhere from four to six other people. Um, and they lock the door behind you and your job is to escape. And it's a series of puzzles that you need to solve. It's like a, it's like an old school adventure game uh, nothing requires brute force or anything like that, but you need to figure out the mystery in the room in order to um, to open the the door out. And uh, there is an emergency exit, so if the place catches fire, you're not going to die. But uh, <laughs> but it's it's just a lot of fun. It takes about an hour. They also have a board game lounge right across the right across the way from them as well. So they're very game oriented kind of place. And just uh, I highly recommend this. So you wind up getting you when you sign up for this, you go in with some uh, with a group, right? That's not you necessarily people that you came with. Well, you can do it either way. You can book the room if you have enough people, or you can just pay for the whole room. Uh, I think it's six or eight uh, spots they have per room per hour. Um, so if you have a group of six or eight friends, you can just go with them. If you are just going by yourself or with one other person, then you'll get paired up with some random folks. Um, and you go in and, and you know, you may be in something that looks like a, a Victorian study or something that looks like a, um, a classroom at a wizard school or, or something, some sort of set that you walk on to. And there are props scattered around that you need to figure out in order to advance the puzzle. Hmm. Cool. It sounds a little like Myst. Yes. Well, well, as I say, it's like an old school adventure game. It's okay. very much uh, solve the puzzle and get the doors to open. Mm -hmm. Rich, what do you have? <laughs> I have. Uh, this is, uh, I'm calling this science because <laughs> it is a very scientific uh scientifically done statistical analysis uh, of a political event, which was the 2016, 11, uh, 2016 election. This is a, a New York Times link 
to an extremely detailed map of the 2016 uh, election. Uh, Everybody has seen things like this before where election results are mapped uh, by area, and this is the highest resolution uh, uh, of its kind that I've seen. It's done by voting precinct, okay? Uh, And it's very interesting. Actually, if you zoom out, uh, you see see a familiar... Uh, resolution of voting by county, but as you zoom in, you focus in on individual states and zoom even further in, and you can uh, see uh, uh, the voting results by precinct. And one th- if you hover over any of the precincts, it tells you exactly how many votes went to either Donald Trump or Hil- Hillary Clinton, breaks it down into um, uh, percentage and then tells you how far you have to go to get to a precinct that went the other way. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. I, this is so cool, Rich. I went to every single address I've ever lived at. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, cause in many places it's, you know, two places per city and, uh, they were all blue, but different shades of blue was interesting. Shades of- so, Rich, yeah. the link you gave uh, brings us to Austin, I think. Right. Uh, oh, it may have me mm-hmm. programmed into but it. Oh. It's interesting because right. Austin, San Antonio, Houston, they're all blue and they're That's surrounded right. by red. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Well, the cities yeah. tend to be blue, right? right? The population centers. Yes. Exactly. Wow. Which, yeah. is how, that- which is how you can win the popular vote by over three million and lose the election. Correct. Remarkable. And the the interesting thing to me, well, there there are uh, uh, big areas of uh, blue that I would not have uh, anticipated, like northeastern Arizona. Yes. And there's this. Uh, it's interesting that the border communities probably have a lot of immigrants yeah. are are blue Native Americans. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Native American. I think that that's the uh, that's the Arizona yep. uh, connection. And uh, well, it's very what's what's interesting is, you know, you can actually tell it to uh, go to a one sided place, a voter island. You can ask it for a random voter island and it'll take you to like here. I just clicked on it and there's a place and this is on Long Island somewhere where there's this one precinct that went for uh, Donald Trump that is completely surrounded with blue. Rich, um, it would be very interesting to know whether or not <clears throat> uh, you could overlay a population map on top of this map and find out where the areas where a lot of people didn't vote. Mm-hmm. That would be very right. interesting. Yes. Right? Because that's those are the areas that you'd want to build up in terms of the next election. I'm pretty sure there are people being paid decent wages by <laughs> to various do that. campaigns. <laughs> yes, to yes. Precisely that type One would of hope that they follow up then. Yes. Um, I, uh, uh, in time. looking at the article associated with this, I think I'm correct in saying that this was somebody's PhD thesis. Right. Okay. And I would imagine that he's got a job. Oh, yes. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be pretty good to put on the resume. So I, I probably shouldn't say this because someone will say I'm being vitriolic. But Ooh, yes. Uh, some, I read that Republicans are using this to show that they have the whole country in their hands. Is that what they're using it? Because there's so much red. But, of course, that mm. overlooks the, the, the population. population. That's why I said <laughs> right. if you don't population. overlay population yes. with that, That's, then you just want to say that. But they probably know sure. that, but they... Can of course, it. they know that <laughs> they yes, can spin it that way, and they know well, the truth is irrelevant. Th- will, will listen. The gerrymandering is so rampant. One of the things that's interesting is that you know I think of Washington and Oregon and California as blue states. Well, but at this resolution, they're not. They're not. No. They're not. It looks no. like California is the bluest. Yeah, but it's popular. Uh, California is pretty blue. You know yeah. what's the bluest? I think is Vermont. Yeah, Vermont's yeah. pretty blue too. Yeah, but in terms of sheer acreage. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, right. The right. Republicans got us on acreage. <laughs> the that's very wide cool. open that's very cool. Dixon, what do you have? Well, I have this latest NASA adventure to send a rocket, uh, a probe towards the sun of all places, of course. And it's called the Parker Solar Probe. And uh, it's got a four and a half inch graphene graphite slash uh, heat shield. 
It's going to get within 3.8 million miles of the sun, which is outside of the corona, but it's pretty damn close. The corona, by the way, is about a million and a half degrees um, and much hotter than That's the surface. That's going to take a lot of lime. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so I looked it up and I, I wondered whether or not the amount of heat that this probe has to withstand is hotter or less hot than the entry um, mm-hmm. vehicles mm-hmm. had to go through. Right. And the entry vehicles had to actually withstand higher temperatures. Mm. So but for th- shorter times. For a shorter time, but still 3,000 degrees is 3,000 degrees. Yes. And the, uh, the space shuttles all had to go through that temperature profile in order to make it back. And so I don't think the Parker Solar Probe is going to spend that much time at a very high temperature because it's got an elliptical orbit. Okay, so the elliptical orbit takes it close to the sun, but then quickly gets it away from the sun so it can transmit their detailed um, findings back to Earth. Otherwise, the radiation from the sun would prevent that from happening, I think. But it's a fascinating thing to do because the last big effort I, as a kid, remember ever hearing about the sun was a movie that was made by Disney called Our Mr. Sun. And it was absolutely fabulous. Actually, it was... Bell Labs. Bell Labs, okay. But it was brilliantly done. I mean, no pun intended, but it was it was fabulous. <laughs> it just got your attention right away. It didn't you didn't lose it until the movie was finished. Uh, I also should mention that this is being managed by Johns Hopkins University. And if you I listed a a, a pro a, a link there too, because it gives you all the details about the uh, satellite. Right. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked two things. One is uh, an ancient earth map and uh, it's pretty cool uh you can see what the earth looked like oh, anywhere nice. from 400 million to <laughs> years ago till now oh, um so and cool. on the top right you can <laughs> click to various things like when did the first coral reefs appear the first grass um or by triassic jurassic etc and they've superimposed the modern political boundaries on it so you can see where countries would be on <laughs> right if you go to the top left, you can enter an address. So if you want to, you know, put in your own address, you can follow that. Um, you can use the uh, plus and minus keys, or I mean the arrow keys on your keyboard to uh, go forward and back in time. And in the bottom left, it it describes things. The only thing that I wanted to do that I haven't been able to do is I wanted to make the Earth. Oh, if you just grab it, if if you just grab the Earth, it you can spin in, yeah. it faster because at any particular time. Uh, I wanted to sometimes just see the other side of the world faster. So you and do that. And it's so much ocean for so much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially, especially when you go, you know, back to, you know, many Two billion years, years ago. That's right. yeah. yeah. And then um, over at the top left in yellow, there's back to dinosaur database. So then it's, you're at the dinosaur database. So I picked that as well because I thought that was kind of cool. It's just got <laughs> a bunch of dinosaurs that I never heard of before. Mm. Um, so the sin raptor and the irritator and the, so forth. Irritator. <laughs> That's um, Fox News, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. This earth, um, earth thing is awesome. It's, it's, yeah. This is just terrific. Yeah. I'm going to play with this for a long time. Right. I immediately oh. sent this to uh, uh, my wife and my daughter. In particular, I want Harper and Porter to have a close look Absolutely. at this. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. This is great. Yep. Nice. Uh, my pick is a New York Times article announcing that if you go to New York University School of Medicine, your tuition is now free. Yes. All now and future students are going to get right. free their tuition. They've raised enough money to do it. They announced it at their white coat ceremony recently. That must have been pretty awesome. Wow. I'll say. Can you imagine? All the, yeah. all the students and parents and everything <laughs> sitting there. And then at the end, they say, by the way, <laughs> we're picking up the tab. Did you, did you hear why they did it? Why did they well, do it? No, they did it because without it, People are in debt so much yep. that they pick specialties in their field yeah. Yeah. so they can yeah. pay them back. Yeah. Not because yeah. they had a passion for it, but because yeah. they could pay them back. So the tuition so. is fifty five grand a year. The average debt of the class of twenty seventeen was hundred eighty four thousand. Right. You're not gonna go into family practice when you owe that kind of money. No, you're not. Or so pediatrics. This will hopefully encourage them to do other things. Right. Now, I must add, you had a comment here about Wait, before you do that. Okay. So in December, Columbia announced yes. a gift from Roy Vagelos to pay tuition for those who were needy. In other words, if you had to take a loan 
they would pay your tuition. But if you could afford it, they weren't going to give you no, that's any right. money. And, that's right. But NYU is going to pay for everything. So yeah. maybe uh, Roy will now pony up Step and do up more. Step up to the plate. Sure. And I think this is cool. At, but so they had to raise four or five hundred million dollars in order to do this. I would say now let's. How about paying the salary of your faculty at medical schools, not just depending on NIH to pay it? Right. It's obvious you can raise money to do this. Right. And I think it's a worthwhile cause because it would take the pressure off of uh, NIH grants. Hey, but medical schools are currently set up to use <clears throat> the research faculty as cash cows to fund the rest of the enterprise. No joke. Of course, of course. So this this does require a rethinking. Of course. However, <laughs> if we didn't have faculty, of course, there wouldn't be a medical school. Well, of so course. You could think of it oh, that no, way. No, you could have one that's virtual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're so going that, towards that, by the way. The article mentions several other places that are going toward this, and I've mm -hmm. been hearing for some number of years that Michigan wants to make Tuition free for all of their students at some point for yeah, medical students. So. Okay, uh, I'm the, surprised that they can do uh, this uh, with the, uh, a mere six hundred million dollars. Yeah. yeah. The, the The example before this was Cooper Union uh, in New York City that offered free tuition for anybody who were, who was accepted to that school, and um, I think they actually had to change their uh, rules. There are some countries where college tuition is free, right? Yeah, Europe. Most well, originally mm -hmm. City College. In New York. Exactly. Well, the tuition's pretty low there anyway. But it still, is, but it, it, originally it when, it was, no, when it was constituted, it was free. Yeah. I hear you. I do hear you. That's a, that's a thought. Make college free, huh? Would Proletarian that Harvard. <laughs> Who has that as their platform? Some some politician right now has that. Oh, I think a number Cuomo, of them have had it. Cuomo has that as his do. platform. Mm. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> in New York State, tuition is free for those who can't afford it. New York State. Yeah, they have a they have a special program now. Mm -hmm. Right, but the the definition of can't afford it is often yeah, rather know. stringent. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right, our listener pick was from Heather, and that'll do it for Twiv five hundred seven Apple Podcasts, Microbe TV slash Twiv. If you listen on your phone or tablet, use your app that you listen on. Just search for Twiv. Subscribe. It'll help us get our numbers up there. And if you have questions or comments, Twiv at Microbe TV. If you really love what we do. Consider donating. Last time you heard from a listener who said, oh, there are only 158 out of the 20,000 plus people who listen. So uh, a few of you responded. Thank you very much. We're now at 165. Cool. <laughs> we have a ways to go. Go to <laughs> <a> nice <laughs> bump. <laughs> TV slash contribute. Yeah, I looked at my Gmail one day and there were five new Patreon subscribers. Wow. Like, oh, wow, this is the beginning of a trend. That's right. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't quite, but oh, well. we appreciate those of you who joined us and and the others consider giving us a buck a month. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier is at the livingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. You were on a grant roll today. This was a great episode for me. Jeez, I'm, I'm happy you say that after everyone. <laughs> no, <laughs> some of them do? I don't understand at all. But this one oh, I understood. Oh, you understood it. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University on Twitter. She's Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. And your your uh, undergrads are probably coming back now. Is that right? Um, we start classes on the twenty seventh, so I have one more week. Here, the medical students moved in last week. And let's see, I talked to Cindy Leifer at Cornell this week. She said their their undergrads are moving in. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in a very blue Austin, Texas. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is on Twitter as Alan Dove. He's at turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>